KATU in the spirit of the Northwest presents the wild winter of 95-96. In Clackamas County, rivers ran wild. Dangerously flooded roadways. We're staying put. We've got nowhere else to go. This is the closest I have ever seen to a hurricane. The brewing cauldron out here. It is an incredible sight today. The ice was half an inch thick in spots. We expect three to six inches of rain over the next few days. This is normally just a little runoff bit. I guess it's going to get roof. Look at it, it's far. It goes clear to the river, which is a quarter mile that way. The biggest body of it, the most important part, is done. <laughs> How do you thank them? How, how do you thank these people? A truly wild winter in the Northwest from Southwest Washington to Portland and the Willamette Valley and the coast, one we won't forget around here for a long time. With all that happened, it's easy to forget when it all started. Late November, record rain and floods, and then our first ice storm of the season. Here's a look at the beginning, November 28th, 1995. In Clackamas County, rivers ran wild. And while most of us slept, the storm's intimidating rain forced people who lived along the banks from their homes. I had to worry about getting our kids out. You know, and we've got two small children that this has been the only home they've ever known. You might call this the Salmon Creek Falls, but this is supposed to be Northeast 156th Street. The flood forced motorists to navigate dangerously flooded roadways. This is surprising that we have this much water with just, you know, with 24 hours of rain. The Zigzag River had already taken part of Carol Wasson's home. Today, it came back for more. In the darkness of the early morning, neighbors heard the frightening sounds as the house was ripped apart. Locals say the Clackamas has only been higher once, in December of 1964, when homes were lost and farmlands ruined. Tony and Terry Herbeck are one of eight families evacuated from the Eagle Creek area. The main road to their home became a canal. The trucks are rolling in and huge rocks are rolling into the river to protect Ann Crockett's home and two others. Joy Smith is heading up this project. She's been working in this area for more than 40 years and she knows when to fight Mother Nature and when to watch out. I'm uh, in awe of it. Uh, every time water doubles its size, it increases its physical force 32 times. The heavy rainfall sent mud, rocks, and logs cascading down the hillsides, cutting off dozens of cars. The problem area is on Highway 6 near Tillamook. We start our team coverage from there with Mark Hass. Mother Nature bore hundreds of new waterfalls in the coast range last night but they washed logs, mud, and rock across major arterials, including three places on the Wilson River Highway. Two dozen motorists were trapped between slides and were forced to spend the night in their cars. The slide looked like it was about 50. One slide broke slide. across the highway right in front of Dan Scott and his family. We come through and missed, this slide missed from hitting us by about two minutes. Just went through and somebody turned around and come back and tried to get out and said there was a slide there, blocked the whole road.
A Coast Guard chopper stood by to evacuate, but lowlanders, even at this RV park, were resigned to hold their ground. The ice chest. We're staying put. We've got nowhere else to go. And then I'll be packing more little things in around now. Meanwhile, the Herbex put their life's possessions into a small trailer. This is everything I own right here, everything I own. The family will watch the weather like everyone else who lives along the Clackamas and pray for an end to this intimidating rain. They told us to evacuate because the water's coming up. Record rain and warm temperatures, melting mountain snows, have swollen the Cowlitz River over its banks. Some residents of nearby Toledo are also being asked to leave. <laughs> U.S. Geological Survey crews say the flood on the Cowlitz River should peak around 10 o'clock tonight. If there's too much, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> There's not much you can go about it. You just uh, kind of watch it and admire it and, you know, just be thankful that I don't have a house up here somewhere. For those that do have homes, putting furniture on blocks and taking what they feel they can't live without is all there's time for. High water isn't the only danger facing houseboats on the Willamette. That could be a tree hanging upside down. Manager Kevin Cloudy watches debris come straight toward his moorage. Listen as a huge tree slams into one houseboat. Like right under. It's going to bounce off. That's been freshly ripped out of the ground, too. This time, the danger passes. This isn't the kind of water you wade through. The cars found that out the hard way. I'm not going in. I don't get it. Oh. It's only by boat that Paul Carp can see the damage. I didn't fathom that it would be inundated to that degree. The water hasn't hit the second floor of their home yet, but everything on the first floor is either floating or sunk. It's terribly traumatic, and it's the thoughts of trying to replace all those goods uh, are, are in, seem insurmountable. A sentimental house decoration is all that car can get to, but their children are safe and happy to have their pet rabbits out of the house, and that's what gives car strength during this difficult time. You have to draw strength from that and say, we can go on from there. Uh, we got the things over time, we will get more things over time. But only time will tell when and if the creek will give these homes back to these families. Cold, icy weather takes its toll on our area. Ice topples a tree into a home in Troutdale this morning. Quite a mess outside. Piece of ceiling come drop on me, and I was just buried in all this insulation. But the storm also caused havoc for travelers along 257th in Troutdale. Drivers found themselves stranded as they failed to make it up the hill. Along I-84, truckers and motorists lined the freeway as they chained up to handle the ice and blowing snow. Snow plows soon work their way along the freeway, clearing the snow drifts that have accumulated here. You can see what I'm talking about over here. Take a look at this power pole and uh, the kind of thick ice we're talking about here. It must be one and a half, two inches thick, still solid despite the weather reports of melting. Perhaps the biggest inconvenience, the shutdown of the Sunset Highway. But the sun definitely didn't shine and the ice was half an inch thick in spots. And more than a dozen stranded drivers spent the night at a Sylvan convenience store. Joseph Jones said he and the others tried to pass the time with humor. Trading stories of, so where's your car stuck? And Joseph Jones got his Volvo back after 10 and a half hours at a convenience store. Life is good. Floods and ice, that was just the start. We barely caught our breath before a windstorm like many folks in the Northwest have never seen before swept through Oregon and Washington. You have to go back to Columbus Day 1962 to compare. But from now on, we'll all remember December 12, 1995. 
this may be the beat of the storm. We are seeing winds gusting up to 90 miles an hour. We have torrential rain coming down, power lines going down all over the town of Newport, and it does appear that it's happening right now in terms of the real seriousness of this storm. Sustained winds of 74 miles an hour or better, and those are hurricane strength winds. You'll see this big structure at the BP going around. It looks like a, an amusement park ride. The wind's just playing with it needlessly until finally it actually ended up on the floor, just exactly where everybody expected it would be. It was a very, very intense day. I, I would say this is the closest I have ever seen to a hurricane. And here's a picture of Izzy's restaurant. The very top of that is, is what blew off. Kind of concerned when we had the Columbus Day storm, there was power outages for five to seven days. Television was virtually useless because of that. So I'm wondering what's going to happen in the days ahead. Jeff Dinoli, you have something new for us here in the newsroom? Well, this could be very serious. We have a report that the dock broke loose at 33rd and Marine Drive. Well, here we are. <laughs> We've kind of been following the situation unfold. These boats, uh, approximately 40 of them, came across from 33rd and Marine Drive to uh, about a mile upriver from the Interstate Bridge. We've been watching these boats, and sure enough, well, as you can see, one right here, about a oh, 22, 25-footer is it just about to go under. We've confirmed three other boats that did sink on their way across the Columbia River, and uh, <laughs> we, we think we see the mast of another one just off the dock down here. Several people down here trying to unload their boats and, and get them off, get their belongings off. It's a very dangerous situation, as we've already pointed out to you. You see people walking around here without life vests on, which to me seems absolutely incredible, considering how rough that water is out there. I mean, one false step, and you're in the drink, and you're a goner. There's, there's no two ways about it. It's a very dangerous situation. We can't stress that enough, and we sure encourage people not to come down here. I've spent a good many years out here fishing and recreating along, its, along this riverway. I have never seen the kind of turmoil, the kind of uh, the cauldron, the brewing cauldron out here. It is an incredible sight today. I can guarantee you that uh, that will not be the last boat that goes down here tonight either. Judging from the, the uh, pitching and rolling that we're seeing on some of these other boats, literally uh, the bows have come up out of the water and dip right down, decks awash. stuff that you see in the street, it came off the top of the Port of Portland building that's 17 floors. Happened about a half an hour ago, a woman I talked to said that she was in a conference room in a meeting and all of a sudden they heard this huge crash, looked out the window and saw the stuff fall over. Now it hit a lamp, they blocked off traffic on either side so you have to be careful if you're going to come across anywhere around uh, the Lloyd Center area. And as you can tell, the wind is really starting to whip up. We're at Wilsonville Primary off of Boone's Ferry Road. And earlier today, even last night, schools were canceling schools, telling kids to go home early. Well, here is a graphic demonstration. Right here behind me, there used to be a roof. Nothing but sky now. This used to be a play area. Typically on a rainy day, kids would be out here doing their recess. But today, fortunately, the kids were in. You can see the roof over there, about a 60-foot roof, now completely splintered. A tree was blown over in addition to the roof. A very scary scene here. The kids were here in school, but fortunately, nobody was outside. No one was hurt. The highest reported wind gust in the last hour here in Portland was 61 miles per hour with sustained winds at 43 miles per hour. All of a sudden, I heard a boom and the window broke downstairs. The door was open and the window, there was no wall in the window. My bed stuck in outside. It was scary. I've never seen anything like that before. And my first reaction was I knew there was people inside the apartment. And they can't see it, and I did. Um, right now, I'm glad that everybody's outside where it's safe. But everybody's pulled together so much. Listen, everything's going to be okay. I have activated the emergency alert system, and I'm advising all storm-affected residents to seek permanent shelter. Uh, we are uh, this evening uh, declaring a, a state of emergency in western Oregon. And look at those parking. 
Julian, listen to that. Listen to that noise as that marks. This is where the wind literally snapped that tree. This shows you the wind's power snapping the tree down. This was not the whole roots just being loosened from the rain, but this is where the wind literally took this tree as if it were a matchstick and broke it. Captured that on film. Oh my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh now we've got a view of Mount St. Helens. Oh. oh my god. Boy, they're going down like tin pins around okay, here. Okay, here's the latest video coming into the Channel 2 newsroom. This was a home video now of a home fire in Lake Grove in Lake Oswego there on Twin for a drive. We're not exactly sure what happened, but it's definitely weather related. This is a house fire. When a tree fell into a home, somehow that started a fire. That's the first fire, Julie. Earlier you mentioned we haven't had a lot of reports of any fires or anything, but that's the first fire we're reporting. And I'm surprised that there hasn't been more of this. You mentioned that earlier with all the trees and power lines that are going down. I'm really surprised we haven't seen more fires. One of the strangest uh, incidents we had was a tree into a home and a woman could have got injured, but she was apparently in her bathroom and she looked up, Julie, and she saw in the skylight this tree starting to fall. She got out of the bathroom and the tree came in and look where that limb ended up, right in the bathroom of this massive tree falling, falling on this house. And look at the limb that came right in there. But she managed to escape because she saw it falling through the skylight. <laughs> you were sitting right here, huh? doing saw, your job in the bathroom. I saw it coming, and I mean to tell you, it was so scary. <laughs> it didn't make a sound until it hit the house. <laughs> and you were sitting there when that came through there, huh? Mm -hmm. Did no, it hit you? actually, uh, I wasn't. I, by the time that came through, I was headed out the door. Oh, I gotta get this done. Get all this. Wow. There you go. There's the skylight. One of the advantages, I guess, of having a skylight in your bathroom, uh, you can see what's falling. And like Chicken Little, you can see that the sky is literally falling on you. It didn't even hurt the sky. Dan Christopher is in Beaverton right now. Dan, uh, give us a rundown of some of the damage there. Well, Julie, it's been a long, long time since I've seen the kind of damage that we surveyed this afternoon, even in a single neighborhood, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage. One area in particular is called Hardwood Highlands. It's a housing development. Most of the houses built in the mid-1970s. A tall stand of fir trees uh, is uh, surrounding all of the homes, except tonight, the big difference is that there are so many of those 60, 70, 80, 90 feet, foot fir trees that have collapsed crashed through roofs they have uh, wiped out uh, buildings one thing and another the uh, patios in the back of one house we saw was just completely upended there were cars that became uh, victims of some of the uh, fallen trees in one particular case we talked to a seven-year-old boy his name was Dylan he was upstairs the second floor of a uh, home that was uh, the victim of a tree as he was playing one of these towering trees came thundering through the roof as he was there, he thought for sure that he was going to die. He was a very, very frightened little boy, and we are happy to say that he got out safely, although it's not uh, a good situation as far as his home is concerned or so many of the other homes around here. Well, dozens of power outages reported tonight. Paula Gunnis is standing by at a power outage in East Moreland tonight. Paula, what's your exact location? Jeff, I'm at uh, Southeast 32nd and Woodstock. In fact, it's raining so hard I can't really even see the camera, but we did want to show you this. This has really made a mess of this neighborhood. This is a down transformer, and I don't know, Corky, can you show the end of the power line there? Look at how it's jagged. And then if we can, we want to show you where this came from. This came from right up there. That's where it broke off across the street. And luckily, it didn't fall into the street. And a power crew has been over here working. But as you can see, all the houses in this area are dark. People are home tonight. You can see the little candles flickering the area. This okay. is the Laurelhurst area. We're inside the home of Dale and Kay Haney. These pictures taken just moments ago. And they're doing what thousands of folks across Western Oregon are doing tonight. They're living with flashlights and candles. We're going to show you how this family is spending the evening here without power. Come on this way into the family kitchen. And this is the Wells family. They're enjoying a game of Scrabble. Quality family time together. Yeah. When else would we all be in the same room doing the same thing? When otherwise we'd be scattered around in several different rooms doing a bunch of different things.
A new day dawns, revealing what was left behind by yesterday's winds of destruction. They stood tall for decades, but now thousands of huge trees have been ripped out of the ground by their roots. Residents must manage without the necessities of life. No power, no water, no roof over their head. No, we have no water, no power. I have no phone, no nothing. Tonight, the Northwest is heading down the road to recovery from the big storm. Force of 100 mile an hour winds took this roof off the Vista Villa apartments in Vancouver. Residents say watching the roof blow reminded them of a Judy Garland movie. Wizard of Oz it was just like that, just raised up and just went like that, and I just screamed. It seemed like the rooftop would have stayed airborne if it hadn't been for this tree. That's the gutter still hanging off of a branch. Oh, yeah, it looked like it was snowing. It was snowing yellow and white insulation everywhere. Well, come on, on down to the bedroom, and I'll show you what I found when I came home yesterday. This tree, at least a yard in diameter, planted itself in this bedroom. Luckily, no one was home at the time. The Thompsons just finished remodeling the outside of their Brush Prairie home. This is a change they definitely didn't count on. Oh, and our other room, if I can get our door open. What's left? Looks like they'll have to leave their home, but Debbie Thompson says no matter what happens with the house, she'll never leave her neighbors. They're the ones who put the tarps up that help keep some of the rain out. And I have never been in such a great neighborhood. We owe these people a lot, <laughs> a whole lot. Uh, as Barbara mentioned, massive power outage is to be blamed up and down the coast specifically, but we can tell you there is light at the end of the tunnel. All Pacific Power customers in the Portland area should have power tonight and the news is encouraging for PGE customers as well. At the peak of the storm last night, more than 300,000 PGE homes were without power. It will be another three to four days though before all power is restored. The fact that the damage happened all at once has utility companies scrambling to make repairs and the outage has left some businesses in the lurch. <laughs> The Zupan's market at Northwest 23rd and Burnside has to throw away tons of food because the power didn't come back on in time. So the fresh juice has gone stale. So is the meat. The dairy products, juices, and frozen foods. They're all getting dumped. Power companies are asking people to hang tough and hang tight because some of these repairs are tricky and dangerous. The weather has been a little tough, but we hang in there. I gotta go answer the radio. Okay. And you can see where the tree snapped off and came through the roof and took out that wall. Yeah. Kathleen Marriott takes her insurance agent on a tour of what's left of her home now that an 80-year-old fir tree has rearranged the place. I was worried about my deductible. I was worried about affording the hotel. I was worried about what they, they cover in terms of the damage. Is there a limit on it? And that's what I'm here to do is calm them down, reassure them that they have coverage and what we're going to do for them under the policy and guide them. Obviously, this big fir tree has created a lot of damage here at the Marriott's house, but it's also affected their neighbors. Some of the branches came down, took down the trusses over here and the gutters, but it will be the neighbor's insurance that will pick up the repair tab for this home, not the Marriott's. And remember all those flattened cars? Well, the car owners better hope they have comprehensive insurance because the property owner is not responsible for the damage. But back at the Marriott's, everything's settled. The owners will spend the next several days in a motel while their home is repaired. There you go. Great. $750. Thank you. And State Farm will be picking up the tab for everything except a $250 deductible. And to give you an idea of the great expense of this storm, Farmers Insurance alone says they expect more than 6,000 storm-related claims at a cost of more than $12 million, just one insurance company. Signs of the storm are everywhere. Imagine the horror of sitting in a pizza parlor when the entire roof blows off. We noticed at the far corner of the building, the roof started to raise it up just a little bit on the outside to a covered patio. And we never thought that the whole roof was going to come off. And all of a sudden, it just exploded and it was gone. Food still sits where about a dozen customers were eating before taking cover under tables. Had they ran out the door to their cars, they may not be alive to tell their story. We were just about ready to get in it, and we, for some unknown reason, we sort of hesitated. 
And uh, when we did, we heard this big boom, and the roof was gone, and we came out here, and all these cars were crushed. An ambulance was completely crushed when paramedics stopped to clear debris from Highway 20 east of Newport. A fellow paramedic says they got out just in time. Had just started to walk away from the vehicle. Someone yelled, look out. He turned around and just in time to see this tree crush his ambulance. As the terror from the storm begins to wear off, the tragedy of the devastation soaks in. This couple says they might have died had they not gotten out of their fifth wheel home before it flipped over. I don't know, it's the only thing I got in the world, man, and it's gone. And we all got scared. We was going to just ride the storm out. We thought we were, you know, tough guys. The toughest problem now is getting power restored. More than a third of coastal towns around Newport are still without it. Somehow, most of the area's telephone service is still working. And when the roof came across, they knocked down three poles, took all the cables out, but they're still working, thank God. Thanks is what many coastal families are giving tonight as they continue to dig out from the storm that's uprooted their lives. Country folks in remote areas are facing big challenges in day-to-day -to -day life today. Grant McCombie traveled through rural Washington County to see how some are coping with no power, no phones, and no water. Forest Grove utility workers clear trees and debris off power lines so the electricity can be turned back on. At Pacific University, six huge trees crashed into buildings and across the campus but haven't prevented students from finding a path toward higher learning. The college reopened today. In the nearby rain-soaked countryside, Washington County's rural residents are just beginning to live with the fact they have no power. Mike Hundley loves the view of his 18 acres from this huge deck, but yesterday he worried the winds would carry it right into his house. Now without power, he can't pump water from his well, so jugs of water will have to do, and he says that could last three more days. This is definitely the price you pay for living in the, in the country, but when you live in the country, you just don't have, you're on your own when something like this happens. You just have to use good common sense. In some cases, it's a matter of too much water. Here near Gaston, Oregon, where they've been without power since the storm hit, waterlogged trees have just laid down on the power lines. PGE crews continue working around the clock to bring the lights back on, but local flooding hasn't helped them. Swollen creeks lap at many doorsteps, and it'll be quite a while before anyone takes a swing at the local ball field. All of this has left many feeling like they've been hit with a one-two punch. Still, many aren't ready to throw in the towel. Dilly resident Liz Jordan says the inconvenience of cooking and lighting with camping gear does take some getting used to, but she sees a silver lining in the dark storm clouds. Well, it's kind of nice not to have the television on, everybody not, we're actually talking to each other and playing games and reading. I think my daughter actually got her homework done last night. <laughs> That's a sense of humor that may well be tested in the days to come. Near Dilly, Oregon, Grant McComey, Channel 2 News. An aerial tour starting at the coast. And stretching to the Willamette Valley shows off the incredible damage from yesterday's big blow. Governor John Kitzhaber has now had a first-hand look at the storm devastation along the Oregon coast specifically. A Channel 2 News crew rode along with the governor as he took an aerial tour of the coast aboard the Air National Guard plane. The governor also toured heavily damaged areas on foot and visited with troops helping clear Oregon coastal highways. The governor says his office is hard at work on a statewide damage estimate and that a request for federal disaster assistance is likely. and I could tell that the tree was going to go. If you have a tree down in your yard, you're responsible for having it removed. If the tree is an elm tree, do not keep the logs for firewood. You're supposed to call the city to come and collect the wood. This is state law because officials are worried the beetle that causes Dutch elm disease might be in the bark. Drive down almost any street and you'll see a tree uprooted in someone's yard and meet a homeowner faced with doing something about it. Yeah, because somebody that. said since it's not on the other side of the uh, sidewalk, I have to pay for it. And it'll cost Cedrice Phillips. 
Um, somebody came over and told me that they would come cut it down like two fifty, so I'll probably end up having to pay two fifty and get it um, cut up. The city doesn't charge to saw up trees that are creating public hazards, like this elm that fell across Northeast 20th and Irving. But homeowners are responsible if the tree is on their property. City tree experts say it's best to hire a reputable tree service and not do it yourself. If you want to tackle it yourself, uh, you are taking some risks. Uh, it's dangerous work. Uh, trees twist and turn, and a lot of them are under pressure uh, from the way they fell. It hits the ground, it's quarantined. If your tree is an elm, state law says you can't keep the logs for firewood. The reason? A deadly tree disease. One of the insects that passes the Dutch elm disease harbors in the bark of the wood here, and so um, it's just a, a eliminating a chance that we might infect another tree. You can see removing trees is not only a dangerous, but delicate business. The experts say don't be in a hurry to hire the first tree service that comes knocking. Ask for references and check them out. Back here where we were earlier, you can see that that's all that's left of the tree and of the car that was smashed by the tree. The city says be patient. There are lots of trees out there. They're still assessing the situation. They will come if the tree is in the street, but if it's on your property, remember, it's up to you. And as you can see back here, we have about 21 trees that have fallen on our property. We just have to start cleaning up now. I think it'll take us probably a year to clean up. <laughs> Earlier today, we took to the air to see just how bad it really is. The view from above reveals mass destruction throughout our region. This is Bull Mountain, where trees litter the ground like matchsticks. Take a look at this house along the Tualatin River. Trees cover it like a blanket. A fly over the coast provides a dramatic view of a mudslide that's closed Highway 101 near Manzanita. Just as dramatic, the destruction in Newport, where the gas station canopy remains on its side. The Izzy's restaurant has no roof. Governor John Kitzhaber also took to the air today to survey the damage along the coast. He's already declared the region a disaster area. Now he says his office is hard at work on a statewide damage estimate and that a request for federal disaster assistance is likely. Take a look at these dramatic pictures from southwest Portland. The driveway of this home was turned into a bridge from the street to the garage. The earth underneath the driveway washed away during the storm, leaving a huge empty space below. The homeowners have roped off the driveway as a precaution. People living on Sovi Island had double trouble from the storm. The wind knocked out electricity, which means residents there can't get water out of their wells. Owners of this dog kennel were gathering water from storm drains to give the animals uh, water boarded there. Humans there are relying on bottled water. They're also coping with cleaning up the mess made from downed oak trees on their property. And one resident tells us an adult foster home on Sovi Island has been hit especially hard with no power or water. Well, one of the most dramatic examples of the storm's destruction was the fiery explosion of a Lake Oswego home. Sheila Hamilton talked to two families and a neighbor who say a Lake Oswego city worker saved their lives. Today, it is a pile of charred wood, a devastating scene of disaster. But yesterday, this was home to two families, Rebecca Williams, her baby daughter, and her parents. The Lake Oswego house burst into a wall of flames and collapsed on the front lawn. It was less than two minutes after a Lake Oswego city worker smelled gas and cleared the Williams to safety. Williams says this huge tree had blown over, pulling the gas main from the home. Maintenance worker Wayne Benson pulled people to safety, then went back to the home to turn off the gas. I'm sure that he didn't really think about how much his life was at risk. He did save those people in the house there because if he hadn't gone and told them, get out of there, it's going to blow, they would have been inside. As Benson turned a wrench on the gas, a power line sparked, and the house erupted into a ball of fire. It's kind of like being in the mouth of a volcano. Benson is in the hospital with burns to his face you know, and lungs. Turned... Just, you know, I'm a guy that was doing his job, and that's the way I've been my whole life, is if I see, you know, something bad happening, I'll step in and try to, try to change it. Burned into his mind is the image of Rebecca carrying her 15-month-old baby to safety. Now that I think about it, I remember, you know, I have a 10-month-old daughter. And um, 
and I could. I hope somebody would do the same for my family if um, in that situation. If there's anything good that can come from a tragedy like this one, it's watching how people pull together. Already, Rebecca has had offers for a place to live and food and clothing for her 15-month-old child. But the biggest gift came from Wayne Benson, a man who risked his life to save others. Thank you, and we'll be in touch.